Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the Bird Dog P100. This is not a security camera, it is a production camera with pan, tilt, and zoom capabilities. And what I like about it is that it's one of the lowest cost NDI cameras out on the market. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from Bird Dog. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this camera is all about. Now, the price point on this is about $1,600. And when you see that price tag, you might say, wow, that's quite a bit for a camera. I could certainly get something that looks like this for less money. But in the broadcast and streaming world, this price tag is actually very, very reasonable uh, with all of the capabilities that they've packed into this thing. So I think the price point is spot on. And this is something that a lot of houses of worship use, a lot of schools use, basically uh, institutions that are doing a lot of streaming these days who are looking for some flexibility in changing camera positions without breaking the bank. Now this camera supports the full NDI. And if you've never heard of NDI before, it is a protocol that allows you to take video out of one of these cameras and put it out on your network much in the same way that you would output HDMI or SDI. I've been using it now for a number of years. It is a game changer, especially for me. And I can bring everything into my vMix system here without actually putting any capture hardware in my computer. Uh, this supports the lossless NDI format, so it'll use more bandwidth, but the quality of the video will be better, and there's practically zero noticeable latency, and we'll do a little latency test later on in the video here. Now, in addition to the NDI, you've got three other ways to get video out of the camera, all of which can be done at the same time. So you have HDMI over here, you have SDI right here, and then you've got USB, and the USB output will appear like a webcam on any computer that you plug this thing into. And a little bit earlier, we were messing around with Zoom on a live stream, and this supports the ability to control the camera remotely on that live stream, so people can pan and tilt and zoom uh, if you grant them permission to do so. And again, all of these outputs work at the same time along with the NDI, so there's a lot of flexibility built into this. Now there's a couple of different cameras in the line. This is the entry level model. It supports 1080p at 60 frames per second max. That's what it's set to by default. Uh, there's also a P200, which costs a little more than this one does, but it has lower light sensitivity and a bigger zoom. So this one has a 10x optical zoom. The P200 has a 30x. So if you need a longer zoom, that other more expensive camera might be the way to go. And they also have a 4K camera that looks similar to this called the P400. Now the lens on the P100 here is a 4.7 to 47 millimeter lens. Again, you've got a 10X optical zoom on it. When you're fully zoomed out, your field of view will be 60.9 degrees. When you're zoomed in all the way, it will narrow to 6.43 degrees. And the maximum aperture will adjust also based on the zoom level. So when you're fully zoomed out, uh, the widest aperture you can get is 1.6, but when you're fully zoomed in, the widest aperture will go down to 3.0. Now you can set the uh, options for resolution and frame rate here with some dip switches on the bottom. They are really hard to see. Maybe I'm just getting old and can't see things, but what you have to do is uh, get the switches set up to the resolution and frame rate choice that they have here on the back. It looks as though this will go from 720p60 up to 1080p60 with a lot of different frame rate options in between. It also supports 1080i if you're doing broadcasts that require some interlacing. It'll handle that as well. Now you also have some choices as to how to power the camera. My preference is to use Ethernet. I've got this Ethernet cable hooked up to a power over Ethernet switch in my equipment room. And when I plug in the Ethernet, as you'll see here in a second, the camera will just turn on and start working with nothing else required. Now you do have the option to plug in DC power if you want. It supports DC 9 to 36 volts. But if you're setting up something in a congregation or some other place where it's really hard or expensive to run more electrical, uh, you can run just standard Ethernet cable out there, hook the other end up to a PoE switch or injector, and you're good to go. And what's really cool about the NDI protocol is that you're getting your video out of this cable too. So you can basically do everything with a single cable, and that includes controlling the camera. Uh, this supports the VISCA protocol, V-I-S-C-A, 
Uh, that's what I use in vMix, but you can also use the NDI protocol in supported apps to control the camera that way. So it's really probably the best way to go, just hook the Ethernet up, but you do have a traditional DC power option if you want it. In addition to the network controls, you can also control the camera via the remote control that it comes with. But again, I think you can't beat the convenience here of just plugging in one thing and getting everything else working from there. Now you might have noticed there's another RJ45 connector on the back of the camera here. Uh, that is not for networking, that is for serial connections. There's also a USB port here below it, and that you can use for bringing in audio to the camera. Uh, there is an included cable here that goes from USB to audio in and out. So if you did want to bring your audio in through the camera, you could do that. Or of course, you can bring it in some other way because the latency is very low on this. Uh, so now what I want to do is get this hooked up to my vMix video production system. Again, this is compatible with anything that supports NDI, not just vMix. So if you have OBS or a TriCaster, it'll work with that as well. And pardon the mess on the screen here. I'm just going to go over to my uh, input selection here. And as you can see, the bird dog camera uh, has been detected automatically on my network. And when I click the button here, uh, that camera, if you look down here, will come right in. Now, right now, I've got it set on the automatic mode, uh, but you can see, first of all, just how good the latency is because this audio is going through my camera that's connected over HDMI to my video system, but everything is just coming right in here, uh, pretty much like it was directly plugged in. And we can, of course, tweak the uh, camera settings for white balance and everything, which I'll show you in a little bit, but out of the gate here, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, let's go over now to my computer and see what kind of power and bandwidth this thing is consuming. So we've got my Unify control panel here up on the screen and I'm able to monitor the local network activity. And as you can see here, the bird dog camera is consuming about 144 megabits per second at the moment. The camera is set for 1080p at 60 frames per second. So that's going to be the largest data consuming mode that it's going to offer. Uh, so we do have room for more cameras on the network, as you can see here, but each one at this frame rate and at this resolution is going to consume about this much data. So you need to make sure that you've got enough bandwidth on your local network to handle it. Uh, gigabit is probably going to be more than fine for four or five of these cameras. So I think in most cases, your standard inexpensive gigabit network is going to do just fine. But if you're doing something more robust with seven or eight or nine or 10 cameras, I would suggest going to a 10 gig network just to give yourself some leeway there. I have two 1080p 60 sources going into my production system right now over NDI. And you can see here we're consuming about 281 megabits per second to get both of those things in. Uh, the computer screen here that you're looking at is actually going in over a lossless NDI at the moment. Now, as far as power consumption is concerned, uh, the switch here reports that the camera is consuming about 12 watts right now. So it's not consuming all that much power and it seems to be working just fine again through that single cable. Now many production systems allow you to use a game controller to actually control the camera. So if you wanted to get a sense as to how it pan and tilts and zooms, you can see uh, how smooth everything is going here. I've got it set at a pretty low speed. You can actually go slower than this, but I found this to be pretty smooth. I'll give you a zoom here also so you can get a feel for that. I'm using this through vMix and occasionally it gets a little bit flaky on me with the game controller, but I think you can find a setting here that uh, works pretty nicely for your purposes. It's also got a pretty decent autofocus on it. I trip it up every once in a while and you can also see that it's got a nice depth of field to it as well. So I'm pretty pleased with the image quality. Uh, the motor on it is very quiet and I think if you get your settings done correctly, you can find a very smooth setting here for doing live camera movements. I've also set up some presets on here. So for example, I can lock it into this position and then hit another key here and have it automatically zoom in a little bit faster onto the remote as a preset. And that's through vMix, but I could set presets on the remote control. I can set them on the camera internally with its web-based control panel, all sorts of different ways to access it. Let's take a look now at the web-based control panel, and then we'll look at their control software and see some of the settings that you can use to get the camera configured. So here is the web-based control panel, and there's actually a lot you can do on this. So if for some reason you can't get into the camera any other way, uh, just hitting the address here with a smartphone will get you in so you can make some adjustments. 
Uh, you can hit the reset button here on the image settings if you really mess something up. You can restart the video if you're having trouble. You can reboot the thing completely if you need to. You have all your network settings here, of course, so you can go to a static IP if you want. Uh, what's nice is that it has a default fallback IP address, so if it can't get an IP, it's always going to give itself this address so you can log in when you're on the road with it. Uh, you do have some rudimentary P, uh, PTZ settings here, so you could have it go to specific presets, but I would recommend making sure you've got the remote control packed in the bag with you when you head out to get finer controls. But if you're stuck, uh, you do have some ability to control things from the web-based control panel and set the maximum speed of the motor. Uh, you also have the ability to access the on-screen uh, settings menu, uh, and it's not ideal to access it this way, but you can if you really get stuck. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, you have some system settings here just to do firmware updates and set some of the NDI settings if you need to adjust those. There's actually pretty robust AV commands in here as well, including the exposure, the white balance picture, and even a color matrix, but this is better controlled through their control software. Now, as I mentioned, there is also an on-screen display that you can get to by hitting the menu button. Uh, this is probably not the ideal way to control the camera because it is very slow and clunky, uh, but you do have the ability to make very granular manual controls as to how the camera operates. Uh, you also have the ability to go into iris priority or shutter priority or uh, set the level of brightness, or if you're like me, just leave it in full auto, because that's how I like to roll. Um, but you do have the ability to go in here and really uh, get into the nitty gritty of camera configuration if you have no other way to work with the camera. Uh, but again, I think their control software is the best way to go. And without further ado, let's take a look at that control software and see what we can do with it. Now, the software is called Bird Dog Cam Control. This is free software available for Windows. And what's nice is that you can have multiple cameras configured next to each other here simultaneously. And you get a full frame image in the preview here too. So you can see the impact of your settings changes immediately as opposed to waiting for the next update to come down from the camera. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is just switch it into manual mode. And if I scroll down, I can do all of the adjustments of the iris and the exposure settings. You can see those happening pretty much here in real time as I make adjustments. Uh, you also have some settings for the picture, basically everything that we saw a little bit earlier on the web-based control panel uh, and within the uh, on-screen display is available here in one place. Some of the buttons here are a little bit messed up. This might just be due to the fact that my Surface laptop here is a more square display. Uh, you also have, of course, the white balance settings, and if you were curious as to what options you have, uh, you've got your presets here, your indoor, your outdoor, you have a one push white balance, there's auto. Uh, you also have some manual controls here for adjusting the uh, red and blue gain, or you can go in and adjust the color temperature uh, on a number of different settings here. So lots of things that you can do to configure everything and get the color to match. And I think the software might be the best way to make those settings changes just because it's easier to use and everything is in the same place. And again, if you've got multiple cameras, you can get them to match a lot easier using cam control. Now the camera is not weatherproof, but it does work outside. A little bit earlier, we went outside with a long ethernet cable and shot some stuff around the backyard. Looks pretty good. This was mostly in automatic mode, so I'm sure I could adjust the image a bit to improve uh, the exposure and overall image quality, but it looks good. Nice depth of field. The uh, autofocus does get tripped up occasionally, so you do have the option to lock in a manual focus if you need that. Uh, but things look pretty good here, as you can see, uh, both indoors with good studio lighting, but also outside uh, with natural light. That looks pretty good there, too. Uh, if you look over here, you can get a sense as to the depth of field that you can get when you're zoomed in a bit. Uh, that looks pretty nice there, at least I think it does. So pretty nice to get uh, all of this on a camera that you can set up and control remotely with a bunch of different presets. And you can see if you had a remote shoot to do with multiple cameras but only one operator, uh, you can dial in a bunch of presets on uh, your favorite production software and go to town with it. But all in, I think a pretty nice looking camera here for the price tag. And it's something that I'm pretty comfortable recommending if you're on a budget. Uh, the camera can be mounted upside down if you need it to work in that mode. 
And I think for the price, you're gonna get a pretty decent camera here, especially if you're looking to do a higher quality live streaming and you're a little limited on the number of camera operators you can bring to bear on the project. I think this will work out pretty nice. It's got a lot of compatibility, a lot of different ways to access the image coming out of it. And the power over ethernet is also a nice thing to have as well. So altogether, a pretty nice camera here. That is gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, Frank Lewandowski, Mark Bollinger, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.